Okay, welcome to the uh, third and final part of this lecture. So I want to uh, basically state one of the main results of my uh, joint work with Vienna and also give you a sketch of how to use all the previous ideas we have discussed to uh, prove this theory. Uh, so the theorem goes as follows. Uh, we're going to have, again, a compact uh, hyperbolic tree manifold. Then in this case, I'm going to assume there's going to be a cylindrical. So this condition of a cylindrical, I haven't uh, defined it yet, but we have already hinted it. So this means that on top of being uh, boundary incompressible, this is going to mean that the double of the manifold, again, reminding you that the double of the manifold is obtained by taking two copies of it and gluing them through the boundary, is a hyperbolic manifold. Okay, so we discussed this case, how this, uh, this case uh, play a role in the inequalities for uh, randomized volume. And this is going to be the set of where we're going to be working. Uh, um, then um, I'm going to assume gamma zero to be the outermost region of M3. If, uh, and let's, let's ignore this part in green for a second, but if the volume of the other most region, I can remind you, uh, uh, in particular, the address that I want for the other most region was that it contained all the compact minimal surfaces in its interior, is that the volume of the other most region is less than equal uh, than randomized volume, then um, the prof the asymptotic profile of n falls below the asymptotic profile of the uh, of the metric in m that has function n. So something that should be known about these cylindrical manifolds. Uh, this is this is a result that followed from work uh, from either Thurston or uh, Macmillan is that in, under this topological restriction. There is, there's going to exist a unique hyperbolic metric that has function ends. So that hyperbolic metric with function ends is the one that's serving as a model against where, against what, against which we're comparing the isoparametric profile uh, of any compact compound hyperbolic metric. So this inequality should follow from any V. And then moreover, we have equality if and only if uh, M has function ends. And here I should point out this, this statement about inequality, about equality is like, it's enough for us to know that we, if we have equality just for one V, then it follows that M has to be uh, equal to the model. Uh, I should single out that while technically for, for uh, especially for, for the people that may have some familiarity, uh, with hyperbolic manifolds that under this setup, technically quasi function manifolds are not included. Um, there is a technical way, uh, mainly through using relatively cylindrical uh, that we will use to get out of this type of statement. Or you can also imagine like and saying, well, either M is the type that I describe it or M is going to be quasi function. So just, just to let you know, like, even though this, this uh, technical condition that will seem to rule out uh, the case when M is cause function, we are considering them uh, in the theorem and the theorem holds, holds for them. Okay, so again, this is uh, just, just to recap, we're doing a comparison result between a superimitic profiles, uh, where our model is given by a very particular hyperbolic metric. And uh, something even to highlight for the hyperbolic metric is that since that hyperbolic metric has function ends, it means it has a totally geodesic realization of the boundary. And if we identify those totally, uh, if we cut the manifold of those totally geodesic um, surfaces and do the doubling procedure through, through them, because as the boundary was totally geodesic, that's exactly the essentially unique hyperbolic metric you know, essentially unique isotopy that exists in, in the top. So this is what we're saying. Okay. So how will we prove such a result? Uh, 
and, 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 and moreover, the part that hasn't still become clear, especially given the, the, first, uh, the first part of this lecture, is what is the role of renormalizable in all of this? So far, uh, all that we're sharing, all that we're hinting is like we are sharing some common language, but no, no other uh, relationship has appeared. Well, that is what this next result is going to tell us, which is a very important lemma that tells us that one half the limit of the difference between the profile with function ends and our profile M, one half the limit of these differences is a renormalized volume minus the volume of the other most region for it. Okay. And uh, if you go back here to our condition, basically uh, what our, our restriction is, is, is telling us is that um, at least asymptotically our inequality is true. So we're basically asking for our inequality to be true when V is equal to thing. Okay. So uh, this, this, this particular inequality is how we're really in renormalized volume to supernormative profiles. And, and in a nutshell is that renormalized volume in a way was already telling you how volumes were controlled at the big scale yeah, uh, in, in, in a way that this big scale volume had to do with a supernormative problem. Okay, so how do we prove? Well, uh, it is just the following. So first of all, um, let's do let's do this procedure on each end of the three manifold. So remember, we construct the renormalized volume by taking a very particular equidistant foliation that, that help us to make this this this, uh, this computation. Uh, one neat quality about this particular foliation is that if we compute the mean curvature of the surface at level R, it's converging to two exponentially fast in R, meaning that the speed of convergence is uh, of the size of e to the minus R, at least. Okay. So this, this the surface that is giving us, uh, that we can associate to renormalized volume uh, they are not in general going to be CMC, but they are the best next thing. They're at least uh, trying to do the exponential trust. Uh, well, this is uh, our construction, a little bit more of a general setup that uh, Marcel Bacar used to essentially say that we can deform this foliation, the foliation that we were using for an MLS volume, to have now a foliation that's going to have constant mean curvature. So that that constant mean curvature is converging to two increase. So uh, because of the nature of the deformation, meaning that the deformation is, is, uh, is also getting uh, exponentially small, we can still write the renormalized volume as an equation uh, that has to do with volume and interior mean curvature of the boundary in a topological term. The only detail is like, well, now this right-hand side is not independent anymore from R, but because we're doing a perturbation that is, uh, is, uh, is perturbing less and less as R goes to infinity, it's like renormalized volume is still, is not equal to this, all these quantities, but it's equal to right to the limit as R goes to infinity. Okay, so that's good. Um, here, on the other hand, um, the, there, is, there, is this asymptotic, there is this asymptotic limit behavior uh, for the area of the R surface, meaning that this log expression, where we have the area of the R surface and, and the function log is, uh, is asymptotic to R. After knowing this lemma, what we're going to do is like, well, now that we have, uh, now that we have these uh, constant mean curvature surfaces, what I would like to do is to start replacing this uh, by expression that had to do with the supernormative problem. So, for instance, 
if uh, sigma r tilde was isoperimetric, then this volume of the interior, well, according to the profile that we define, this is V plus uh, the volume of the outermost uh, region. And that's because V is the volume outside of the outermost region. So this volume here is gonna become this term here. Um, on, on, on. On this side, the uh, area of sigma will have to be the isoperimetric profile of V. Then uh, we also will have like the mean curvature, since it's going to be converging to do, is going to be converging to two. Then this factor is basically going to contribute uh, half of the separate profile. And then we're going to have a term here, right? When we're using the, the, the height of the foliation, but because we have this uh, particular limit, we can replace this height by a term that is essentially logarithmic in terms of the profile, right? Well, here I'm using that. I can basically relate R to the area of sigma. Sorry, here it should be sigma prime, but it should relate to the area of sigma. And that has to do again with the profile. All of this plus, uh, some constant term that has to do with the topology of the boundaries. I'm just calling it CJ. Of course, uh, I, I express going to this inequality basically from uh, this limit equality to this limit equality as a wishful thinking, right? I was saying, well, what if sigma prime was going to be, uh, we're going to be CMC? What are going to, oh, sorry. Where besides going CMC, we're going to be a parametric. At least one of the results that, that, that we prove is like this surfaces that were constructed were uh, constructed by uh, Marcel Pocard, uh, especially because we have that uh, mean curvature is going to be increasing. It's like more than being yet CMC, uh, they're going to be strongly stable, meaning that the uh, second uh, derivative of area is going to be positive definite. And moreover, um, uh, they're actually going to be isoperimetric for R sufficiently large. So because we, we, you know, we, we, we prove that this is a little bit more of a sketch, it's like we're allowed to basically substitute this for expressions that had to do with the isoperimetric problem. So then what do we do? How do we finish, uh, how do we finish this, uh, this expression here? To, uh, uh, to arrive to, to the equality that we desire, is like, well, we have created this, this very general equality that works both for M and for the model structure that has function X. Uh, so the thing is like, when we write the function, uh, the model that has function N, both this renormalized volume and the area of the outermost region, they're gonna cancel. They are actually going to be equal to one another. It's a very similar situation to when we prove that function manifolds have zero renormalized volume. So then these two factors are gonna cancel uh, uh, when we have, uh, are basically the same when we do the case when M is going to be uh, uh, half the function X. So what do we do is like we write this equality for the M we're interested. We write it for the structure with function ends, and then we take the difference. As we take the difference, uh, well, V is gonna cancel because we, we wanna choose to create the same variable V. The term CJ is gonna cancel. The renormalized volume of uh, the model with function ends and its outermost region volume, they're both gonna cancel. So here we're gonna, uh, we're gonna only be left with the renormalized volume of the particular M where we're going to be interested. And then we're going to have the difference between profiles. And then we're also gonna have a term that has to, is the opposite difference of the logarithm of the profiles. And uh, well, of course, we're going to have the, the outermost region. 
But the way it turns out is like, as we calculate this limit, technically here, there should be an extra term that has to do with the logarithm of the difference of the profile. It's like that limit can be uh, further reduced to just register uh, this difference of problems. So after taking that difference and, and doing all those cancellations, we end with this equality here. So sorry, this, this term is also here, it just got a cut off. But basically, if now I just said this uh, volume of the other most region here to, to subtract, then I have the desired inequality of the lemma, which is this one. Okay. So uh, again, where is the lemma is useful is the lemma is basically telling you, yeah, you can assume that the um, inequality is asymptotically true as it equals to infinity. So why did that come in handy? Why, why is that sort of like step zero? Well, because of the following. First off, um, something I'm, I'm, um, something that is uh, well known in uh, for for hyperbolic geometry is 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 the following is that uh, we already knew, and this is, takes a little bit to unpack, but we essentially knew that the profile of N fall behind the profile of N with function X. So the reason for this is that when you take a volume equal to zero, you are essentially taking regions that contain the other most region, have zero volume in between, so your only test is going to be the outermost region. And then essentially all that you're comparing is the perimeter of the outermost region for M and the outermost region for uh, when M has function X. So what occurs is that in this particular case for this outermost region, the outermost regions are going to be uh, a stable minimum surface, surfaces whose uh, first derivative, uh, sorry, whose second, uh, derivative of area is going to be non negative. So, for this type of surfaces, uh, it's, it's, it's a consequence of the uh, second variation of area formal and gospel net that the area is maximized uh, if and only if the minimal surface, more than just being minimal and stable, is actually totally jealous. And, well, not. Uh, not to uh, too much surprise, but well, the generic limit of n, this is just minimally stable. But if m has function ends, then its outermost core has totally geodesic boundary. So it is exactly the type of minimal surface that maximizes area. So we have this inequality greater than or equal, and moreover, we have equality, we can only have equality here if and only if. Uh, M has function ends. So this is what I'm putting here. So what occurs? Well, uh, usually the, the profile we tend to, uh, you, can, you can draw it in, the, in this type of picture when we have here volume V versus area. So what we want to show is like the asymptotic profile for the structure with function ends here in red. We want to show is strictly, uh, it's always staying above the supremacy profile for any given. So what we know, what this first uh, discussion was, was, was showing uh, is that at zero, at least, the structure with function n wins. What that lemma before, show you is that if you are assuming that the renormalized volume of M is uh, greater than or equal than the volume of, it, of its other most region, then we know like towards infinity, the profile of M is a staying below uh, the profile of the volume. Right, at, at, at least let, let me assume for simplicity that that you think is positive. So, so this graph is actually true. So what could go wrong if you want to prove this theorem is that in between is the profile of M 
who decide to uh, go strictly above the profile of the model and then you know, decide to go below because it knows that towards infinity it needs to lose again. So a situation like this will happen. Well, if a situation like this can happen, because we know that the behavior uh, of, of the versus of the profile, uh, both at zero but at infinity, we can do the following. We can take the point for which uh, this difference maximizes, meaning we can take the point for which the difference between the profile of M and the profile of the model is the biggest uh, positive value. Okay, so we're going to take such a point. And what we're going to do is at this point, we're both going to compute the Hawking mass for M and the Hawking mass for this structure with function. Okay. So again, just to uh, remind you, uh, on, on the second part of this lecture, we saw the Hawking mass uh, has to be this uh, monotone only case uniformity that has to be non positive and is zero if and only if you have function x. So if I grab the Hawking mass for m and I subtract the Hawking mass for, for, for the same volume for the model manifold, then I'm going to obtain here a term that has to do only with the Hawking mass of m. Uh, because the Hawking mass of the model is going to cancel. And then, uh, well, then I can write out what that difference is, is exactly going to be. And then I'm going to end with this expression. It's going to be, uh, uh, again, you know, you have to go back to, to the formula when, when we grow what the Hawking mass is. But once you do the appropriate cancellations, you're going to end with this. Okay. Uh, again, for simplicity, let me, let me also see that the profile is going to be differentiable. So, because we're taking a point, we're taking a maximum of uh, profile of M minus profile of the model, then we know that the derivative of this difference has to vanish at this particular P we're looking at. And because that derivative has to vanish, that means that the derivative of the model and the derivative of M they have to be the same, right? Because the derivative just uh, distributes uh, to each term. So these two derivatives had to agree. And if you remember, these two derivatives had to be equal to the mean curvature of the respective uh, CMC surface. So this whole expression that comprised the, uh, the Hawking mass uh, of M has to be equal well, because these two quantities are equal to h squared, uh, if we factor this out, it's going to be the difference of the profiles times one minus h squared over four. Well, uh, because by, by assumption contradiction, uh, we were assuming, uh, uh, we were trying to analyze if this can be positive or we were taking the point where this was the highest. And um, something that also, of so course, is like all these CMC surfaces or um, all the CMC surfaces in a manifold with function ends have mean curvature bounded by two. So each of these terms will be non negative, which of course is going to make their product non negative. Uh, but we knew that this uh, reduced to a term uh, that was exclusively. Uh, just the Hawking mass related to that particular uh, volume V of the manifold M. So it, it, uh, it cannot be strictly positive. So the only option is like, this is going to vanish. Again, if the Hawking mass has to vanish is because M needs to have uh, function X. So again, for all this inequality, we know like, this particular situation cannot happen, meaning the green graph cannot go strictly above the red graph. And moreover, it teaches you also that uh, whenever equality happens, it's because some Hawking mass is going to vanish and some Hawking mass is going to vanish uh, if only if well, m is equal to the one.
Okay. So that's a brief sketch of um, of the proof. Again, some some of these details, as, as I'm putting them, at least in in, in the spirit. This is how we how we talk about them, and you know we probably have to spend just yes, some 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 lines of equation inequalities to actually prove them. But this is um, in in essence when they went true. So I want to finish uh, the the discussion of this main theorem both by uh, highlighting that this is not an empty theorem but also um, opening the floor for, for an open question, which is the following. So I had already described you that there is a, um, there is a very explicit technology of how to produce this hyperbolic money. So we know we have a lot of examples like this. And I have shown you that it was already known the renormalized volume was greater than or equal than half the hyperbolic volume of the lab. Well, there is a result of uh, Egil Storm and Thurston that uh, essentially proved that the volume of the outermost region is also greater than or equal than half the hyperbolic volume of the lab. But technically, we don't know. Uh, we only know that these two qualities are greater than or equal than this common interesting number. But we don't know in essence if there is uh, such a relationship in between them. So you could worry that, well, maybe we just grow an empty theory because maybe this never happens. Uh, maybe renormalized volume uh, never had the gas to be bigger than the volume of the other most region. So let me give you one uh, very nice example that is as follows and it's here one is renormalized volume bigger than the other most region so here's a very simple case um there exists uh remember when we were looking at function manifolds we saw that there was a uh unique totally geodesic surface sort of like at the middle of it and that total geodesic surface is also, is also actually the whole outermost region that in this case has degenerated uh, to that total geodesic surface, meaning there are no minimal surface outside this total geodesic surface. So it turns out, and um, this uh, follows from, from work of Fullenbeck, that there is a bigger class, uh, an open class, of quasi-function manifolds uh, that are usually known in the, in the literature as almost function, that have the property that there exists a unique uh, minimal surface uh, sigma container. In particular, these, these minimal surfaces are, 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 these examples are characterized because the principal curvatures are bounded strictly below, uh, are bounded strictly between minus one. So in these cases, when there exists a unique compact minimal surface, then the whole outermost region is just collapsing to the sigma, which means that this outermost region um, has zero volume. And on the other hand, and in this case, because we're looking at quasi function manifolds, you know, either by the work of Bridgman, Brock, and Bromberg, or parallel of, of my work, you know that renormalized volume cannot be negative. So for this particular class of almost function manifolds, you know that renormalized volume um, is greater than equal the volume of the other most region. Uh, so so uh, for this example, you know that at least the, the theorem is not empty. The theorem is still the same. And now you can furthermore ask, well, when is this true? So in, in all the examples we know, which you know, basically by drawing this picture, I have basically told you all the examples for which we know how to present them in, in this comparison. Uh, for all these examples, uh, it seems that uh, it is true. It is something that, that we can verify. And it's essentially because calculating the volume of the other most region is, is something tricky to, to do. This entity is not, it's not necessarily continuous. I, I think. 
I'm not mistaken, and this is something I'm happy to, to discuss during the Q&A session, I think that uh, there is a semi-continuity that you can have on this quantity, but that's the best thing. Uh, whereas, you know, this, this side is nice and analytic as I have, as I have had past. So this is a very legit question to ask when is where are exactly the conditions of our theorem we want to be satisfied? And an ambitious conjecture, and well, you know, ambitious could be not, 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 I'm not trying to read difficulty, I'm trying to say that um, it's, it's not necessarily clear if it's going to be true or not, but something that it will be very neat if it holds is like if this inequality holds always. Because it's in particular, if you go back here to the inequalities I wrote at the beginning, uh, the first inequality uh, was known by Eggleston and Person. So if you were able to prove this inequality, you would not only be proving that our theorem applies for any compensable compact cylindrical manifold, you will be proving a strictly stronger result than the result that was proved by uh, Richard Brock and Bromberg or myself. So it is, it is, it is a, it's a very interesting question because it has, uh, uh, it has, uh, the, 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 this question has application, has uh, implications in all this, in all this thing. So wait, thank you for, for your attention and I look forward for any interaction during the uh, Q&A session.